Okay, so uh, we come to the morning session from 10 a.m. to 11.30. Uh, so before we start, we shall look at these teachings, wholesome dharmas and unwholesome dharmas. So Nivarana Suttas is, is deal with the unwholesome dharmas. And these unwholesome dharmas is five hindrances and afternoon session, we will look at another wholesome dharmas, that is seven factors of a vacuuming. The five hindrances are the unwholesome dharmas leading away from Nibbana, and the seven awakening factors are wholesome dharmas leading towards Nibbana. So the morning session will deal with the unwholesome dharmas. Uh, is from is quoted from the Nivarana Suttas, and the afternoon session we deal with wholesome dharmas, is on the seven factors of enlightenment or awakening. There is Pariyaya Suttas, and why these suttas are selected for our sutta reading today? Uh, if you know uh, four establishment of mindfulness or four foundation of mindfulness. You will know there are four types of establishment of mindfulness. They are the contemplation of the body, contemplation of the feeling, contemplation of the mind, and the contemplation of the Dharma. And under the contemplation of Dharma, Dharma Nupasana, there are five teachings under the contemplation of Dharmas. Of these five teachings of contemplation, particularly five hindrances and seven awakening factors are to be highlighted in our study. Uh, they are to be included under the mental factors, which are the mental qualities of mind, consisting of wholesome as well as unwholesome dharmas, and they are associated with the mind. That is why they are to, invest they are to be studied in our suttas today. Uh, if you look at other three dharmas, they are in a broader sense of constituents of actuality. They include six inner and outer sense bases, five aggregates of grasping, and the four noble truths. And what are four noble truths? They are causes they are suffering, uh, causes of suffering, they are cessation of suffering, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Uh, in Pali, we call Dukkha, Samudaya, Naroda, and Magga. And of course, uh, through the analysis of these dharmas and what is covered, there is no self entity apart from their constituents putting together calling a person or pukala, and they are impermanent. Okay. Is it okay? Can you hear me? I saw someone say it's still getting the echo. Mm. Okay. Now, this morning, we are, we are going to read uh, these suttas. Uh, Nivarana suttas is from the Sakya Nikaya uh, 46, uh, suttas 40. Uh, is from the Bojanga Sangyukta. It's connected discourses on the factors of enlightenment. And this, is, this sutta is called Nivarana suttas, hindrances, discourses. And if you look at these suttas, I will put in black at Pali words. Uh, for our better understanding of the Dharma. Uh, first of all, we look at Nivarana. Okay? Nivarana is from the root vrt, okay? means to cover. And the ni is a prefix, mean down. It means that cover down, yeah? cover down. So it means that our mind is completely covered or hindered. And so this suttas in brief is talking about that hindrance, Nivarana, 
cause blindness leading away from Nibbana, whereas the awakening factors, the Bojanga, caused vision leading towards Nibbana. Now, I shall read the suttas, okay? So we can read together. Uh, this one is, is, is taken from the Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Um, okay, I read. Because these five hindrances are markers of blindness, causing lack of vision, causing lack of knowledge, detrimental to wisdom, tending to vexation, leading away from Nibbana. And what five? The hindrance of sensual desire, in black head, Kamachanda Nivarna. It's a mecca of blindness. And the second is the hindrance of ill will, Bihapada Nivarna. The third, the hindrance of sloth and topo, uh, Tina Mid Nivarna. And the fourth, the hindrance of restlessness and remorse, Udacha Kukucha Nivarna. Fifth, the hindrance of doubt is a mecca of blindness, Vichikicha Nivarna. Okay, leading away from Nibbana. So these are five hindrances. And these five hindrances are meccas of blindness, causing lack of vision, causing lack of knowledge, detrimental to wisdom, tending to vexation, leading away from Nibbana. Now we look at seven factors, okay? So these seven factors of enlightenment because are markers of vision, uh, markers of knowledge, promoting the growth of wisdom, free from vexation. More importantly, it's leading towards Nibbana. And what seven? The enlightenment factors of mindfulness, Sati Sangbojanga, uh, is a mecca of vision. Second, the enlightenment factors of discrimination of states, Dhamma Vichaya Sangbojanga. The third, the enlightenment factors of energy, Virya Sangbojanga. And the fourth, the enlightenment factors of rapture, Piti. Sang Bodjanga. A fifth, the enlightenment factors of tranquility, Pasaddi Sang Bodjanga. Sixth, the enlightenment factors of concentration, Samadhi Sang Bodjanga. The enlightenment factors of equanimity, Upeka Sang Bodjanga. It's a matter of vision leading towards Nibbana. So these seven factors of enlightenment are makers of vision, makers of knowledge, promoting the growth of vision, of wisdom, free from vexation, leading towards Nibbana. So this is the whole suttas of the Nivarna suttas uh, on the hindrance discourse. Okay. <clears throat> Now, Buddha, uh, my instruction to you. Okay, look at the slide. And the Buddha says, you know, to the bhikkhus, they said, bhikkhus, a monk should dwell mindful. Uh, the word is sati, and fully aware, uh, sampajana. And this is my instruction to you. And in Pali, it's called sato, bhikkave, bhikkhu, vihareya, sampajano. Ayang wo amhakang anusasani. And this verse is taken from the Mahaparinibbana Suttas. And if you look at this uh, short uh, you know, sentence, it contains two very important teachings that are given by the Buddhist before his passing away. And these two teachings are called Sati and Sampajana or Sampajanya. It means being mindful and full aware and which are specifically, uh, specifically uh, thought by the Buddha himself 
in the Mahaparinibbana Suttas, and of course in many other suttas as well. And what are these teaching? Right? So as we are reading the suttas, okay, this morning, Nivarana Suttas and the afternoon suttas, uh, you know, let's Nivarana and the Satabhajangas are thought, you know, contemplated, is and we are trained to be mindful and aware of the object. And of course, uh, this required great effort in cultivating them. So now we look at the right effort as we're talking about the right effort, right? And if, if you know the right effort, right? Uh, you know this fourth thing, that is to prevent the arising of an arisen unwholesome state and to abandon unwholesome states that have already arisen. So this part is to prevent uh, the unwholesome state of mind, a kushal mind. And this a kushal mind uh, refer to five hindrances. That is to say, to prevent right, the unwholesome state of mind, such as hindrances you know, from um, erupting, okay? from coming up. Huh? And the second is the abandoning of the already present active hindrances. Okay, then you look at the three and four, this is more on the wholesome state of mind, the aroused wholesome state that have not yet arisen. And the fourth is to maintain and perfect wholesome states that have already arisen. It means that the wholesome state of mind, um, for example, the satabojanga, yeah, which are you know untainted by defilements. And particularly, they are conducive to the liberation. You know, there are seven factors of enlightenment that we are going to deal with this afternoon. And it says that in the right effort, you know, the first task is to bring into, you know, being the undeveloped liberating factors. It means aroused, yeah, undeveloped liberating factors. And the second is to persistently develop the awakening factors, you know, that has already arisen to its full maturity. And before uh, we come to, you know, analyze the fine nivarnas, um, we shall look at uh, the Buddha's path of enlightenment, all right, or the, the path of the Buddha's enlightenment. And um, the Prince Siddhartha was struggling for enlightenment. And um, he learned, you know, under two great teachers of his time and practiced alone. And uh, later on, he practiced alone the extreme forms of ascetic practices, you know, for six years. Well, he was thinking how to go ahead. Suddenly, a memory comes to him. Yeah, this is a passage. It's taken from the Majjhima Nikaya 36. It's Mahasachaka Sutta. I recall that when my father, the Sakyan, was occupied, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, secluded from the sensual pleasure, secluded from the unwholesome states, I entered and dwelt in the first jhana which is accompanied by thought and examination. That is a vitaka and vichara. We have rapture and happiness, that is piti, sukha, born of seclusion. Could, be, could, could this be the path to enlightenment? Yeah. Then, following on that memory, he came to realize this is indeed the path to enlightenment. Now we look at this path enlightenment. And this path of enlightenment, it shows is the mindfulness of breathing. That is from the Anapanasati Suttas. Uh, it's, from, it's taken from the Majjhima Nikaya 118, Sutta number 118. And so in the Anapanasati Sutta, there is a reference of concentration, of mindfulness, of breathing, 
uh, when developed and cultivated, fulfills, okay, the first one, for establishment of mindfulness. In Bali, it's called Chattaro Satipatthana. And the full establishment of mindfulness, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the second one, that is the seven factors of enlightenment, Satipatthana. The seven factors of enlightenment, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the third one, that is true knowledge, Vijja and liberation, Vimukti. So, three points are to be noted here. One who cultivates the mindfulness of breathing, he fulfill for establishment of mindfulness, or sometimes we call for foundation of mindfulness. And second, he fulfill the seven factors of enlightenment. That is, we are going to see this afternoon. And the third, he fulfill the true knowledge and liberation. Okay, I will give in general, what are these knowledge? Okay, so it says that when someone who accomplished the full foundation of mindfulness and the Satabhojanga, he will acquire three knowledges. And these three knowledges are the first, recollection of his past life, right? And the second is about the knowledge of the passing away and rebirth of beings. And the third is the knowledge of the destruction of the tense or of defilements. Okay? Yeah. If we look at the full establishment of mindfulness, okay, and the sutta will start with this. He said, it says, this is one way path or ekayano, okay, or direct path, ekayano. Monks, for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of grief and lamentation, for the extinction of pain and sorrow, for attaining the right way, for the right, direct realization of Nibbana, that is to say, the four ways of attending the mindfulness. Now, okay, we look at a general survey of four uh, establishment of mindfulness. So, um, in the practice of the contemplation of the body, there are six categories. Uh, under these six categories, there are 14 methods of the contemplation of the body. Okay, the first one is anapana, in breathing and out breathing. Abiding by body, no matter what method we used, breathing and out, right? We apply mindfulness, okay, contemplation, right? Without any attachment to whatsoever object. So, of course, here the mindfulness in and out, you know, is an object of the contemplation, okay, of the body. This is the first one. And then you also have, uh, we look at, uh, you know, we look at the second one, it's about the postures of the body. It means that it's a mindfulness of the postures. What are, what are these postures? In brief, it's, it's about the walking posture, standing, sitting, and lying down, yeah? So it's, it, it says the training of mindfulness and po of the postures uh, focuses on the full attention on the body in whatever position. For example, like when walking, one is aware of walking. When standing, one is aware of standing like that. Okay. So when sitting, one is aware of sitting. Uh, when lying down, one is aware of lying down. Or when and changing posture, one is aware of changing postures. Yeah. So this is also apply the mindfulness and apply the awareness on the posture of the body. And we look at the third one, full awareness. Okay, full awareness. And it says, how is a monk fully aware? 
okay it says okay that when a monk you know go for a walking you know forward or backward then he is aware of what he's doing you know going forward and backward etc huh? or say like if he's bending okay or stretching you know he is aware of what he's doing you know bending and stretching etc or even when he is eating drinking okay or chewing or testing uh, he is fully aware of that too so the fourth is applying the mind to repulsiveness of the body um so this is what what is this now when you talk about the mind repulsiveness of the body uh the buddha teaches uh to counter you know attachment you know to the body especially in the forms of uh, sexual desire and of course this meditation is aimed at weakening it weakening it so to start with takes one body as an object so you can use um, a visualization as an assistant okay so you can mentally analyze the body into 32 different components and investigate one by them one by one um, bringing you know their repulsive nature to light and of course, we don't have time, you know, to go into these 32 parts, but basically these 32 parts are like this. Very brief one. The first five is like the head hair, you know, the body hair, and the nail, and the teeth, and the skin, etc. etc. Okay. So the fifth one is applying the mind to the material elements. So this is the types of the analytical contemplation deal with the body as well, but in a different way. And this is a meditation we call uh, the analysis into the elements. And this method is also the mental analysis of the body into the four primary elements, earth, water, fire, and air right so for example is like uh, you know the earth okay representing the solidity you see and these solid elements represents you know the body's solid visible parts such as organs tissues and bones etc right so uh, you know when we talk uh, uh, you know, to analyze the body in this way, then we will realize that our body is in constant change and there is no true self-existence. Huh? And the last one is about the nice symmetry. Uh, this is the contemplating the body's disintegration after death, um, which may be helped either by imagination or with the aids of pictures or through the direct confrontation with the cops okay so they are all together nine means of cemetery meditation okay now we look at the second one vedana anupassana is a feeling triggers latent defilements into activities so this is the second one this second one is a contemplation of the feeling and feeling is an important object of contemplation because it can easily trigger our latent defilements into activity. But we are uh, not quite aware uh, of the feeling. Um, so in a very subtle ways, feeling nourishes the unwholesome state of mind. For example, uh, when a pleasant feeling arises, we fall under the influence of great defilements and we cling to it. When a painful feelings occur, we respond to displeasure, hate, anger, or fear. 
when a neutral feeling occur, uh, we usually uh, generally not really notice it. Then our mind is governed, you know, by delusion. So you know, from these charts, it can be seen that each of the root deformments is conditioned by a particular kinds of feeling. Yeah? Greed is conditioned by pleasant feeling. Aversion, hate, is conditioned by painful feeling. And delusion is conditioned by neutral feeling. Now we look at the third foundation of mindfulness. So this is a contemplation of the mind. And to start with, we shall look at the Buddhist conception of mind. Yeah, where is mind? So ordinary people are things that the mind is an enduring huh, faculty, remaining identical with itself through the cessation, cessation of ex experiment, uh, experience. And however, uh, in the Buddha's teaching, the, mo the, the notion of a permanent mental organ okay, is rejected. So, the mind is regarded as a sequence of momentary mental acts and devoid of permanent entity. So in our meditation, we observe the in-out breathing as one of the methods of meditation. However, we all complain that distracted thought okay, and hindrances come every now and then and our mind got distracted. So it is the mental concomitants or mental factors that are disturbing our mind then our mind, you know, the whole mind, you know, got disturbed. And it says in this uh, contemplation of the mind, there are these 16 kinds of mind arises due to the influence of the mental factors. The mind is quite passive at first. Yeah. So when we talk about the purification of mind, Sachita Pariyodapana, we are talking about the mind is being purified, you know, through the certain methods, you know, the, of meditation, like samatha and vipassana meditation, um, and they provide the various, various kinds of antidotes, to, you know, apply, you know, to ease the mind from the or to remove or to get rid of, you know, the unwholesome mental state such as greed, hatred, delusion, or the scattered or unconcentrated mind. That is why, you know, the untrained mind is quite passive. They are is, it is easily influenced by the different mental factors. Yeah. So there are these 16 kinds of mind that arises due to the influence of different mental concomitants. Yeah. Of which some of the wholesome mental set, uh, you know, mental factors making the mind wholesome. Like the mind, you know, without lust, without uh, aversion, mind without delusion, or a developed mind, uh, surpassable mind, concentrated mind, and free mind. So these are the wholesome mind. Yeah. So some are un unwholesome, you know, making the mind unwholesome as well. So they are mind with lust, mind with aversion, mind with delusion. You see, the crane mind, a scattered mind, undeveloped mind, unsurpassable mind, unconcentrated mind, and unfreed mind. Okay, so this, in brief, we look at, now we look at the fourth. It's a Dhamma Anupasana, yeah, contemplation of the Dhamma. And there are these five methods, okay, subjects of contemplation. And these five subjects are the hindrances. You see, we are going to see this, Nivarna. And the grasping of five aggregates, Panchu Padana Khanda. Okay, the six inner and outer sense bases, 12 sense sphere, Ayatana. Seven factors of enlightenment, Bojanga. And the last one, four noble truth. So you look at, you know, 
the Dharma Anupasana, the five methods of contemplation of Dharma, we will see today, you know, two out of five, you know, for our studies. One is the hindrances, and the fourth is seven factors of enlightenment. Okay, I think this one is clearer for you. So, the reason why studying these two dharmas uh, that are five hindrances and seven factors of enlightenment, I think it's very clear, right? They are the mental factors associated with the mind. It means that the five hindrances is a wholesome mind and the another one is the unwholesome mind, right? And whether they are wholesome or unwholesome, you see, we have to be mindful, right, aware, and they have to be repeatedly contemplated and cultivated. So ultimately, you know, one's abundance, findrances, and developed seven factors of enlightenment for the realization of Nibbana. So this, this is in brief. I, I don't think you can see this, but anyway, uh, you know, what we have earlier, you know, summarized, you know, in this uh, summary. Okay. Now, Now we come back to the five hindrances. Okay, the five hindrances require uh, special attention because they obstruct the way to celestials and nibbanic bliss. This is what the sutta says. Yeah. And what are these five hindrances? Okay, so we remind ourselves. The first one is the sensual desire. The Pali word is called Kamachanda. And the second one is ill will, Bihapada. The third is dullness. And drowsiness, sloth and topper, atina midda. The fourth, restlessness and worry, or remorse, or dacha kukucha, and doubts or uncertainty, vichikicha. So we shall look at them one by one. Huh? Okay, now we look at the sensual uh, craving, uh, kama chanda. Here is a compound word of kama and chanda. Kama here means pertaining to the five senses of sight. Okay, it means that there are five types of sense pleasure. Uh, it is, for example, like agreeable sights, sounds, smell, taste, and touch. All right? And chanda means delight in or, ag or agree with. So the compound kamachanda means delight, interest, involvement, you know, with the world of the five senses. Now, uh, for example, when we are meditating and you know, hear, say, like a, vo a sound, and why we can't simply ignore it? Huh? Why does it disturb us very often? Huh? And I, I remember in one of the Ajahn Chah's talk or books, huh, he said, in his forest monastery, you know, the local villages surrounding his monastery, you know, they used to have a party. And when they held the party, you know, they play in you know, the loudspeakers and the noise, you know, from the loudspeakers was so loud that destroyed the peace in his monastery. So his disciples complained, you know, to his teacher, Ajahn Chah, that the noise was so disturbing uh, their meditation. Uh, then the Ajahn Chas, you know, reply, uh, it is not the noise that disturbs you, it is you who disturb the noise, you see? So I think it's worth looking into, yeah? It is not the noise that disturbs you, but it is you who disturb the noise. And of course, it is very difficult uh, for ordinary people to overcome the Kamachanda because we are so attached you know, to our five senses and their affairs. And whatever we are attached to, uh, we find impossible, you know, to release it. And this sensual desire is interpreted in two ways. Sometimes it is understood in a narrow sense, you know, as large, you know, for the five types of sensual pleasure. Okay? And the second, that is in a broader sense, okay, broader interpretation. It is a craving for the sense pleasures, for example, like wealth, power, 
position and fame. So, so this is how you know we should you know being mindful and aware, uh, even when the sensual desire arises in in us. Okay. So here the Buddha's teaching is that because whenever sensual desire is present within him, a bhikkhu understand sensual desire is present within me. Whenever sensual desire is absent from him, he understands sensual desire is absent from me. And he understands how the sensual desire that has not yet arisen within him comes to arise. And he understands how the sensual desire that has now arisen within him is eradicated. He understands how the sensual desire that has now been eradicated will in future no longer arise within him. So this is the Buddha's methods of training. You know, when sensual desire arises in him, you see, and being aware of it. And then this one, you, you can see that you apply a lot of great effort you know, into it. And then in the commentary, it talks about the sixth method of casting out the sense desire. For example, it says that taking out the unattractive meditation object. Okay? So, as we have seen that this unattractiveness meditation object, that could be, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, you know, the, say like, you can contemplate on the, you know, swollen corpse, you see, uh, you know, the decomposition of a person who died until finally remains only the skeleton, you see. And in that way, you know, it helps, you know, to cast out the sense desire. And then the second one is application to the development of Pachara Samadhi or Jhana based on the unattractiveness, uh, meditation object. And the third, guarding the sense door. Okay, and the fourth is moderation in food. Okay, so we have to restrain, you know, there are certain food, you know, uh, you know, that give, give rise to the sense desire, and we have to be moderated, right? And sympathy and support of noble friends, yeah, kalyanamitas, and stimulating thoughts that thought that helps the accomplishment of the object in views. Okay, now we talk about the restraint of the sense sense door huh? here. Um, the Buddha's, you know, in the Anguttara Nikaya also teaches us. He says, having seen a form with the eyes, a bhikkhu does not grasp its mark and feature. Since if he left the eyes faculty unrestrained, bad, wholesome state of longing and dejection might invert him, and he practiced restraint over it, and he guards the eyes faculty. He, uh, he understands that restraint of the eyes faculty. Yeah, so this is a training. So it means that when in meditation, um, um, you know, then when sounds come to you, you just be aware and knowing, knowing, knowing. So now we look at the second one, Bihapada, huh? ill will. This is the second hindrance. And when we talk about the ill will, you, know, you also talk about the hatred, anger, resentment, repulsion of every shade, whether directed towards other people, or towards oneself, or towards objects, or towards a situation. And ill will uh, towards a meditation object is also quite a common problem for people uh, who have been uh, meditating uh, on the breath, for example, without much success yet. And you may sit down and think, wow, this is going to be very difficult. I don't really want to do it. Oh, I got to be a good Buddhist, and this is what Buddhists are supposed to do. So you have start, if you have started your meditation with that kind of uh, ill will towards meditation, doing it, but you are not liking it, then it is, it is not going to work. So you are putting a hindrance in front of yourself straight away. And we look at the Bihapada also the similarly, also it is said, 
He said, whenever ill will is present within him, he understands ill will is present him. So this one requires a lot of mindfulness and being aware that the ill will is arises in you, is present in you, or is absent from you, or ill will that has not arisen within you comes to arise, or, or ill will that has arisen within him is eradicated, or ill will that has now been eradicated, well, in future, no longer arise within him okay so this is the second part now we look at the <clears throat> oh yeah talking about six things helps to cast ill will out uh, this one is fine in the commentary yeah talk about you know six method so it says that the first one taking out the practice of loving kindness uh, is an op meditation object uh, that is to say uh, you have to be. You have to show the goodwill towards yourself. So to overcome, uh, you know, the ill will, you know, the hindrance, uh, you know, we are encouraged, you know, to do some loving kindness meditation, and give yourself a break and say to yourself, the door to my heart, okay, is open huh, to all of me. And I allowed myself happiness. I allowed myself peace. And I have goodwill towards myself, enough goodwill to let myself become peaceful. If you find hard to extend loving kindness towards yourself, you can counter us why. You see, why you cannot develop the living kindness? Could there be a deep seated guilt, you know, the complex insight, and that you still expect um, punishment? Or you haven't given yourself enough, you know, uh, unconditional forgiveness? So the forgiveness is a healing. Huh? That's why among our sanghas, is every day we have to ask for forgiveness from each other. And the forgiveness itself is a very good healing. And forgiveness can resolve a lot of old problems and never creates new ones. So you can program you know, yourself uh, to, like, to delight in meditation. For example, uh, you have to train yourself. I like meditation. I enjoy attending meditation retreat. Okay, so you can encourage yourself when attending the meditation retreat. You can you can you know encourage yourself like great. I'm attending a meditation retreat. I'm looking forward to it. Or you can even remind yourself, wow, oh, so happy attending such a wonderful retreat. It was so beautiful. And you also can think that attending a meditation retreat, you know, um, that I did, I, I did not do, I, I will not do anything. What I got to do is just sit down and do nothing else. Yeah. So nothing to do. Uh, no email to write, right? No phone call to make. I just only need to sit there and be with my good friend. What is your good friend? That is your breath. <clears throat> so you are showing a goodwill towards yourself. Right? If that is the case, there isn't any slightest bit of aversion. Uh, so this is quite uh, so this this is a kind of training. Uh, when we attend a meditation retreat, we train ourselves that ah uh, we are expecting a meditation retreat. Ah, oh, so wonderful is a meditation retreat. You see? Uh, then the second one, <clears throat> applying yourself to the development of jhana on the thoughts of loving kindness, right? Reflecting on one's action as one's own property. All right, so we should not do it. Eh? With the Buddha's teachings on the karma eh? and abundance of wise attention and sympathetic and helpful companionships are the good. And the sixth one, stimulating thought that exists, the developments of the thought of loving kindness and the overthrow of ill will okay now we look at the third one right i think it's about the slot and topo 
uh, I think I no need to describe in detail because I'm quite sure that you all know is it through our experience of meditation. And you see, so what's dina? Uh, it's, it's derived from the root t, it's to string, right? So it is a shrinking state of the mind, like a cock's feather, you know, before uh, fire. Uh, it is opposed to virya. And Tina is explained as chitta gelanyang, uh, sickness of the mind. One is dullest, manifests as mental inertia. And middha is from the root mid, it means to be inactive, to be in, inert, to be incapable. And this is the morbid states of the mental factors, drowsiness, seems in the mental uh, sinking, heaviness of mind, or excessive inclination to sleep. So, <clears throat> when we talk about the downness in meditation, yeah, it is a result of a very tired mind. Huh? Usually one has to be, you know, usually one that has, you know, that has been overworking. And say like, if you are fighting with the downness, you know, make you even more exhausted. And... So the best is to go for rest. Huh? So the resting allows the energy to turn back, you know, to the mind. But anyway, in the commentary, right, the Buddha talk about, uh, <clears throat> you know, propose you know, add methods for dealing with the slow and torpor. Uh, or it is in the Anguttara Nikaya uh, seven. <clears throat> So, sorry, let me see. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the first one, uh, when you have the slot and topper, don't attain to the perception. Don't pursue it, all right? When the drowsiness is there, you know, don't attain to it. Uh, you're just aware and knowing that the drowsiness, you know, has come to, Come, come to existence, are uh, you nod it, nod it, right? If not, then you can recall to your awareness the dhammas that you have heard and memorize it, re-examine it, ponder it over in your mind. So when you talk about the reflecting on the dharma, that is basically the Buddha's teaching, and that helps to focus the mind, you know, preventing you know, the mind from drifting aimlessly. And also it's a reminder you know, of the uh, higher purpose may have the effecting may have the effect of inspiring us and of arousing our energy and enthusiasm. So, what are these? Uh, you know, the higher teaching like four noble truth, right? Or noble effort path, or you can give yourself an inner you know dharma thoughts, or you can even imagine that you have explaining the teachings to a friend. So, I would suggest okay the practice of committing this teaching you know to memory and that helps you know when we have any of this thought and topo it helps you know to this effort really you know pay off in terms of uh, the mental clarity and the third repeat aloud in details the term as you have heard and memorize it so yeah, this is also the same advice, but here we are talking out loudly. So this is also further, you know, going to prevent us, you know, from falling asleep. Of course, uh, for obvious reason, uh, this method is not very appropriate when you are meditating with others. Yeah? And the fourth one, you see, if that doesn't help, you can go pull both your ear loops and rub your limbs. So it means that now you move on to the physical stimulation and it gets the blood flowing, huh? or you can do the yoga stretches, um, you know, so that helps. And the fifth one, or you get up from your seat, and after washing your eyes out with water, look around in all directions, it's like refreshed, right? So that you won't fall asleep. And the sixth, uh, you attain to the perception of light, uh, develop a brightened mind. And if you have uh, candles, okay, on your altar, uh, 
Let's try, huh? Then you can open your eyes and look at the candle, and you can visualize the light, and you can imagine that you are looking at the bright light, or uh, if you relax and just notice your few awareness, you may notice that uh, some part you know, of your experience are brighter than others, right? So you can pay attention to those in order to keep yourself um, to keep yourself alert, right? So that perception of light that helps. And the seven that is percipient, all right. It means that to have, uh, to be to be al to be aware, alert, what lies in front and behind, right. So you can go for a walking meditation, right. Going backward for, huh? and your senses inward emerge, and your mind not straying outward. And lastly, right, <laughs> the Buddha says, you know, recognize that sometimes you really just to take a nap. So he said that you probably can recline on your right side, you know, take out the line postures, one foot placed on top of the others, and mindful, alert, with your mind set on getting up. So before you, 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 you take a nap, uh, you can remind yourself that you're going to take only for 10, 15 minutes, okay? So then as soon as you get, wake up, you know, you get up quickly with a thought. I won't stay indulging in the pleasure of lying down, the pleasure of reclining, the pleasure of drowsiness, right? So it means that you are now training yourself to reflect on the valuable life and precious life of a human being. So I wouldn't say indulging in the pleasure of lying down means um, you can say that we are very fortunate enough, you know, uh, in this life to have met, you know, the Buddha's teaching. So since I have this opportunity, you know, I, I have to strike hard. So reflecting like this, huh, uh, we will incline less to slot the topo and more to the bright awareness. So this is advice the Buddha's, you know, given to the Moglana. And to us, you know, these methods are still very relevant and useful. Okay, and of course, there are also some other techniques for dealing with the hindrance of the slot and topos. You see, yeah, in other, other places, it says that you know, overeating is also uh, make you drowsy. Uh, so, probably, you know, when you feel drowsy, you try to change the postures, okay, or you can stay in the open or associate with a good friendship or you know, stimulating thoughts that helps to dispel the dullness and rigidity of mind. Okay, now we look at number four. Udacha kukucha, is rest, restlessness and remorse. Now we look at the restlessness, udacha, is agitation or excitement, which drive the mind from thought to thought with speed and frenzy. Um, you see, when I talk about the restlessness of current, or arises. That is because uh, we are not appreciate the beauty of the contentment. You know, we we do not uh, you know acknowledge the, the 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 pleasure of doing nothing, right? And we have a fault finding mind rather than a mind that appreciates what we that what's we already there. Uh, so the restlessness. Uh, in meditation, is always a sign of not finding joys in what you are doing now. So, so we have to change our perception right? in meditation. Uh, we can see the breath as dull and routine. We can see it as very beautiful and unique. If we look upon on the breath as something new, then we won't get restless. We won't go around for something else, right? So sometimes you may think, I'm not going deep enough. So I've been watching my present moment, you know, for so long and I'm not getting anywhere. Huh? The thought is a very cause of, this thought is a very cause of the restlessness. 
So in our meditation, right? It doesn't matter how the meditation is going to be, right? But be absolute, right? Contain with your meditation. Then if you are contained with the meditation, right? Have joy and peace, then it will for sure go deeper and your mind won't get restless. So if you are not, if you are not satisfied uh, with the progress, then you are making it worse. So learn to be contained with the present moment. All right. So as the contentment you know get deepened, then it will actually give rise to jhanas. So now the another one is worried. Kukucha is a remorse, you know, over mistakes, anxiety about their possible undesired consequences. So the remorse, according to the commentary, right? And the remorse over the evil that is done is also worried, kukucha. And the remorse over the good that is not done, it has the characteristics of grieving over the evil that is done and the good that is not done, right? So I think the story of uh, Angli Mala is probably a best, uh, a good, uh, a well-known story. And he was a serial killer. Yeah, and it says that he killed 999 people. You know, the last one, he, you know, he when he killed, he cut the finger, you know, from each of uh, the victims, and you know, put them in a garland, and hung them around the neck. And the last one, you know, supposed to be the Buddha's, but of course, you cannot kill the Buddha. Instead, the Buddha, you know, uh, asked him to kill him, uh, kill his bad way, uh, kill his deformities. So later on, Angli Mala was uh, become a, a Buddhist monk. And you see, even a serial killer, uh, Angli Mala, could achieve the jhanas and become fully enlightened, uh, fully enlightened. So no matter what bad things that you have done in your past and or what you feel remorseful about, always remember Angli Mala. Uh, so that you don't feel bad about yourself. So <clears throat> We have to learn to, you know, forgive. Huh? It means that letting go of the past, right, is what that you overcome your remorse. Okay, and now we look at, you know, six things conducive to the casting out of restlessness and remorse. Right? It says that being learned in Buddha's teaching, questioning, understanding, uh, disciplinary rules of Vinaya. Associating with those more experienced and older than ones in the practice of things like virtue and sympathetic and helpful companionship and simulating thoughts that helps the rejection of restlessness and remorse. Mm. So there are this. And the last one we see the Vichikik Cha. The Vichikik Cha is doubt or uncertainty. Uh? And of course, usually when we talk about the doubts, uh, it is a doubts with regard to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And of course, uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya commentary, it says that uh, it is called the, the you know, Vichikiksha because it is incapable of deciding that it is as such. I think uh, <clears throat> regarding the doubts towards the teaching, uh, you should have enough confidence by now, I think, to know, uh, you know, the beautiful results that's coming, you know, from practicing the meditation. And I believe that you have, you know, experienced many of them already. So, <clears throat> allowed uh, those positive experiences uh, to strengthen, you know, your confidence that meditation is worthwhile. So sitting meditation, developing the mind in stillness, especially developing the mind in jhanas, are all tremendously worthwhile and will give you clarity, happiness, and understanding of the Buddha's teaching. So you probably have self-doubt yeah? for many people is that, no, I can't do this. You know, I, I cannot meditate. I'm useless. It's a, I'm hopeless. 
So you can switch it out the way around, you know, giving yourself positive, you know, that giving yourself, uh, uh, you know, encouragement. Huh? You, you can tell yourself, yes, uh, you know, I can achieve all of these things. Huh? Uh, and many other people, you know, have achieved them. Why not me, you see? So uh, you have confidence, right? That you want, that you can achieve whatever you want. So in a meditation, if you have sufficient determination and confidence, then it is just a matter of time, you know, before you proceed. And of course, only those, only people who fail are those who give up and they cannot see it. So you encourage yourself, right? So it's a matter of time. Huh? Don't always say that I cannot lie, I can't do it lie, you know. Uh, so that's very bad. Huh? The attitude is very bad. So, so much doubt, so much uncertainty in, in, in you. Uh, so we have to, you know, switch to, you know, the positive, you know, from negative to positive, encourage yourself that you also can succeed it, you know, that other people also can do it. And now we look at, last one, huh? we look at the six things help to throw out doubts. Okay, it means that, you know, you have to be learned in the Buddha's teaching. Right, a questioning about the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and understanding thoroughly the nature of discipline and being decided about the truth of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, sympathetic and helpful companionship, uh, stimulating thoughts that help dispel darkness. Okay, so um, my talks uh, discussion for today uh, is ended here.